and then you think that it's healed, but really there's an infection growing under the surface. And so she essentially just blamed, and what I took from that, sexual assault on men. And we've never, ever, ever really to have a conversation about how sexual assault happens to boys and how it affects and penetrates our communities in ways that we will never probably understand because we're refusing to believe that boys get sexually assaulted just as much as girls do. So let me shut the time. Let me tell you why they go work that why they say Because I feel like 
it's so much easier for us to hide and hide things uh, as opposed to addressing things. Mm -hmm. I feel like our Kelly is one of me, and I feel like we're so focused and so zoned in on our Kelly because they have this meme circulating that says, your daughter won't tell you that her abuser is abusing her because you're defending our Kelly. No, your daughter won't tell you that, in my opinion, that her abuser is abusing her because she still got to have a dinner with her abuser on Sunday. I don't think that our children make that connection. I think that we're sending a very wrong message when we focus on a public figure. And I believe that we've done that. We, we've been there, we've done that for how many years, and there's no, there's been no solution. May I interject? Sure. Okay. So, so let me put like a five-second pin so we can officially get started. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> directly. Um, a lot of you weren't here for that one. That one in particular was um, in regards to male locker room talk. So that was more so why her conversation was focused on that, but there were a lot of things that I can agree with that were problematic in her statements. But that's what she was dealing with. That was her point of reference, and that was the audience in which she typically engaged. So her entire focus was to deal with guys in the locker room, uh, college age, if I'm not Okay? Yep. So, um, I do, but I, I, I don't know. Then sometimes I get her. <laughs> I know. It's going to be bad, too. I know. I, that's what I'm saying. So, it's all right. I'm Toya Bell. I am also a survivor of 
my story is a little different. I was abused from the age of 12 to 17, and inside of that abuse, I was abused again by an outside perpetrator at East of the Land of Living. Um, by me being 12, of course, you really don't know how to fathom that or what to do about it, but um, when I told my mom about it, like when it happened, like it happened, I went home and my mom told me that's what I get. I was trying to be grown, and she finally humiliated me in the hospital again. I'm 12. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on, whatever. So you're in the emergency room. I have um, doctors and nurses and police and everything. And she's further humiliating me. Like you better make sure you're telling the truth because if you're not telling the truth, he's gonna get in trouble and he can go to jail and he can this. So in that moment, I checked out my life. It was a wrap. So. Person who gave birth to me is gonna treat me like that. There's no more stories for me to tell anyone because this is my mother. So if my mother, then you, 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 you're not gonna hear it because my mother didn't want to hear it. And it went on, maybe about a year or two later, the police came to my home. The guy was eventually arrest, arrested. That was the one that raped me inside of the abuse. So he was eventually arrested, an uh, other abuser. Eventually I got to my teenage years and I kind of got myself out of it, but he's still in the land of the living and still on earth and he might be on Facebook. Hey! Hey, Brother Taylor. I'm just going to finger. I need more detail once we go down the path. I'm here. I'm in the land of the living. I'm okay. All right, I'm Joe Starnes. Uh, brother. I'm her brother. Uh, by trade, I'm a concert promoter and I work in marketing, but I also um, am, I guess people say I do okay talking about relationships, but I also just study the sociology and, and uh, generational identity of black people uh, as a culture and the things that we do and don't do. And so I'm here as not um, as a survivor, but more as a, um, a just as a screaming board and as a person that can bring balance to this conversation. Uh, I'm not a perpetrator. I'm not a victim per se. We'll get into that though. Mm -hmm. I think about that. I did like, yeah, some sexual experience. I probably should have had from 16. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, we will we will talk about those things. But uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to be a voice a voice of balance and. Uh, and talk about things for, uh, from a perspective, especially what we did with black people. Um, even the reasons why your mother did what she did. Let's have a real conversation about some of the stuff that break down us uh, emotionally and spiritually uh, so that we can really deal with it. Uh, Joe Starnes again. Hi, my name is Satin Baptist, Black of Religion. Um, Um, 
know, my husband um, have, have a consulting company. Barbara's has an associate's where we have three legs where we do service. Um, we have a service leg, a counseling leg, and a training and um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a train and evaluate program. Um, like her, I really have a lot of that. Um, I'm a human trafficking specialist for Juvenile Cook County, Cook County Juvenile Court. Um, I sit on the Dallas Wells Task Force. I also sit on the, I sit on the opposite side of that, that policy commission. I sit on the um, justice, the juvenile justice um, partner to that so that we um, can direct policy. I recently wrote a book. Um, I am a survivor and um, I'm a mom, a wife, and an advocate. Um, my area of interest is human trafficking, but, and I'm glad that you called me here because so many times we confuse what trafficking really That's is, right. and it is absolutely a form of sexual abuse. Yeah. But we, we, we clean up words when we want to point out who's the victim and who's the perpetrator. Yeah. And so, so, so often, trafficking victims have been deemed the perpetrator and not the victim of what is definitely rape. Hey, hey everybody, my name is Jason Thomas. And, uh, you know, when I'm doing a presentation or any speaking engagement, this is always like the most difficult part of doing the introduction. And the reason why is because I'm just that ordinary guy. There's nothing like very extraordinary or anything like that. But there's always a story behind that ordinary person that we never hear about. And uh, I'm career oriented, I work at War Warner, which is an automotive transmission plant. I make pretty good money. I'm married, uh, family oriented, family's well taken care of. But what's the story? So I, you, you sound like, okay, you're okay. But why are you here today? That's the, that's the question. And uh, let's, let's go back to my childhood. So I was born in 1981 on the south side of Chicago, the Roseville community, uh, to two great, awesome parents who loved and supported me. And uh, they nurtured me, taught me everything I needed to know. Uh, they uh, did anything that I wanted to participate in. They were always supportive. I was the only child, so you know I was spoiled. Uh, I got everything I needed, and they provided me with everything I wanted as well. And you like skin. And I like skin. Yeah. So that works out too. And I Take my 
my parents because I don't want the community to look at my parents as they couldn't do their job or their parental job. Wow. And then secondly, I didn't want anybody to look at me as if I was homosexual or I, I wanted it and I brought it upon myself. So instead of saying anything, I just allowed it to continue to happen and I accepted it as what it was and it came out to who I had become. And all of that frustration and anger came up to that, those bad behaviors that I, uh, that I, that I did. So. Thank you, Jason, for sharing. Thank you, everyone, for sharing why you're here. Um, I'm going to have Justice come up so she can speak to how this came about in the first place. Um, and then Kay can share your story, and we'll keep going. Justice, you want to? Yeah, so I'm not going up there because I, <laughs> I, I can't find a good way that I want. So this is what I <laughs> I said this on Facebook earlier. So my name is Justice Sands. I'm the executive director of the Marion and Janice Sands Street And I come off as an antagonist a lot of times on my social media because I'm always looking for things to be done under the surface. So in everything that I say, I'm typically saying I don't want to do surface work. Yeah. Even in my sorority, in my organization, in my family, in my work to me. My parents did a lot of the civil rights movement from Dr. King through the Black, Black Panther Party. So we, my sisters and I, have lived a life of service. Um, and in doing so, a lot of times we're placed in a position where we have to do the background and dirty work that people don't want to do, that you don't speak on and things of that nature. And so I had no intention on participating. I actually only had the intention of hosting because I don't want to continuously say that we need to have conversations and we're not having conversations. And so I say to people that I'm not an expert at this. I don't know all the answers to anything. However, I have a space. And as long as I have a space, then I'm going to make that space available for us to have conversations that no one is willing to have. And so the biggest thing about this conversation that I felt like needed to be had in which I had no intention of participating in. Um, but today I was just like, I have to say something because it means a lot to me based on his story, to be quite honest with you guys. So we just saw the bed I work, right? Or the sentencing, the record was mm -hmm. already written. And so immediately there was anger, there was rage. And then we went to rationalizing. Yeah. And so now my timeline is filled with bunches of black people saying, well, black on black crime has to stop right. working for us, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so a lot of times on my social media, a lot of things that I connect to, some of the things that's going on with our young men and our community particularly, I always say, whenever we have conversations about the R. Kelly's or even the Bill Cosby's or whoever, or the Olympic culture, whatever, I always say, so we're not going to have a conversation about what other black women are doing, what they're doing in the community. Anybody that's on my social media will tell you that I say that. Because I do believe that a lot of what's going on with our young men particularly in our community as it relates to the crime and a lot of things that they do that are harmful to themselves and they're inflicting on others has a lot to do with things that go unaddressed with it. Yes. And so I have a life of privilege, so to speak, that he had, but differently. Um, in regard to, I was protected because of who my mama was. I was protected because of who my daddy was. That's not Florida. You can't even speak to her. Yeah. Right? That's Mary Stamps' daughter. You don't look at her funny. Yeah. And I didn't even know that I had that privilege, right? And in all the power that my parents yielded on the streets. On the streets. Mm -hmm. I still didn't get protected from that one thing. Wow. Right? Wow. And so the irony of all of that is that my mom lived her life every day, feeling that she had to protect her children. Wow. And she didn't put us in any environment where harm could come to us. Yeah. And the one time my mother went against what she would traditionally do, I was harmed. And I didn't tell her. Well. Because I didn't want to hurt her. Because I would force her to be something that all these years she had happened. Right? right? And so it is it's critical for us to stop. I don't want us to be Facebook advocates, Facebook activists. It's awesome. Right? I want us to have some conversations that are extremely uncomfortable. I'm going to be the person that people are probably going to hate in these conversations. Because I'm going to revert back and I'm going to say some things that people are going to be like, but, 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 you should, 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 how come, da, 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 you've been complaining that's it, or whatever, whatever. But I still don't think 
sure of the problem. Like, for example, and I can tell you, we want to talk about R. Kelly. Oh, wait, I don't know if you want to put this in. Yes, just, just say how we got here, please. <laughs> so, now, say you, that. Did you fly something? Um, you get the hook. So, <laughs> don't, don't sit down. Right. Now, you can interject once we get the questions flowing and going. You can get that point out. Oh, and then they told me that we couldn't allow my young girls in my program to come to this without parental consent. Yeah. Okay. So, as you all can see, I didn't get parental consent. Because we don't want to have these conversations with our kids. Who said absolutely? I'm a city funded program. Right. I'm a city funded program. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the standard. I was going to lie. That's why I put that. But then I was in a meeting. Talking about funding. Who's here to be the guys? Right. Or the yeah. 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 And so, this is a hard conversation that we've just been low key kind of ignoring and sweeping under the carpet. And so, who are the people that are here need to be here? Because it's not just about, you know, we gotta we gotta talk about awareness, but we gotta also talk about how victims who still struggle uh, with their victimization and how they should be able to heal through the process. Absolutely. So we could have all these intellectual conversations and be all sure how smart we are and how intellectual we are, but if we're not geared toward prevention and healing, then we're just being a bunch of smart people in the circle. And we can do that anyway. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So this is not the platform for us to, you know, I feel like I'm smarter than all y'all. Yeah, you like, should have. I, I feel that way about you and you. <laughs> but, and me too. Uh -huh. uh, and, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't want this to be a platform. I just want to set the tone that this is not be a platform that we just say a bunch of cool stuff to win. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. we talk about that. Let's figure out solutions. Right. And let people develop a, a process to be able to heal as well. So, right. Right. Oh, no, 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 you're fine, you're fine. Um, we're just, we're here to kick start a conversation at the end of the day. This is a conversation that as black people in our community, I'm always talking about black folks first and foremost. I'm going to throw that out there that I care about America and I care about the world, but I care about my people first and foremost yeah. in my community because we're the ones that get left behind. Um, in the black community, we grew up with our generations that tell us to brush things under the rug. This stop today. This is the conversation that we're kickstarting, that we're broadcasting to get that conversation and, and stop that. Nick that in the bud today. My name is Keisha Mathis. I'm from Maryville, Indiana. I like to give my disclaimer I'm not a life coach, I'm not a mentor, I am not a therapist. I'm just a woman that has went through hell and back, and I'm here to tell my story. Um, I'm 10 years old, I was molested um, by a female, a cousin of a cousin, and my unwashed. Until last week, I had never said that out loud. I am 28 years old. Right. No! Wow. I never, and I never realized until last week that it did affect me growing up. Yeah. Never in my life. It happened one time. I went on my life. I prayed every day, you know, in the church. It was Easter Sunday. And I went at 20 years. I never, I can vividly remember every aspect of that moment. Um, wow. I was raped one year ago in December by my boyfriend for about a year. Um, so, even coming from that aspect of 10 years old and a fresh new experience uh, a year ago, um, I can say that I'm healing. You know, we, we you know, I, I speak to women that, it's women in my inbox now that uh, are 60 years old and still dealing with these traumas that have happened in their early ages. We want to stop. We want to start the healing, and we want to show the faces of healing, and that it is possible to overcome, and it is possible to move forward. Um, first and foremost, to get things rolling, I don't know. I'll talk about that long. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> Eventually, he pushed the boy. 
boyfriend out of the room, and he proceeds to have sex with the unconscious Jessica. Now, do we consider this right? In our culture, in today's society, um, drugs, alcohol is pushed, Molly's lean. In this society where, you know, that's, that's the cool thing to do. Everybody's doing it. If you voluntarily choose to become intoxicated or under the influence, is that necessarily considered great? In the old times, law said if you drunk, can you say it again? It was still right. It wasn't right. It was specific. Getting drunk was a stigmatism of you was okay to have sex. Yeah. It was a consent. However, mm. if I can't say no, and if I can't wake up, and if I can't see, and I didn't yeah. say you could come in here, then it's not a no. It's not a yes, it's a no. Automatically. Beginning in the door. You didn't, I didn't ask you to come in this. I didn't ask you to come in with this. No. So if I can't see you hear you, I can't get consent. I'm intoxicated. I can't get consent. You can make it, we as a society, we make an excuse for a man being drunk that hit somebody with a cop and we'll say, you know, he was drunk. Yeah. He didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. If my mom used to say, a drunk man speak a soul man. I can't speak at all, so I can't be sober. I'm unconscious. You don't have a right or anybody has a right. And now with the new law, it says, even with the unconscious person, we are to take that report. We are to file those reports. It doesn't make a difference if I have that, if I've been drinking. That's no longer on the table. So I'm so glad that they took it off the table. Right. And it goes far, it goes beyond just being unconscious. If you are in influence, if you are under any influence, you can't consent. I mean, I'll say this. <laughs> as Susceptible to 
to a number of <laughs> disease family or diseases. Um, so I was very clear when I did eventually figure that out the month of the surgery on my, on my part, but uh, I eventually did forgive him, and I made it very clear, no, you know, I, I don't trust you, I don't trust that. So first foremost, that was that initial no to me. Um, we ended up going to celebrate my birthday. We went back to his house. I volunteered to sleep on the couch. Um, and we had, was, I, we had, had had sex before, so it wasn't like a, we were having sex before. Um, he would say, no, no, nothing going to happen. Nothing going to happen. You know, you just sleep in the bed. We're, we're not going to get them. And nothing did happen. We went to bed. And this morning, she got up to go to work. And I guess he decided he wanted to sit. <laughs> and most men pop up in the morning and ready to go. Um, and of course, I said, no, long story short, he ripped my clothes off. I climbed and clawed and tried to get away, but my 14 stature can't fight off a 400 pound man. Mm -hmm. So, with that being said, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Six, three, four hundred pounds. <laughs> with that being said, if a person consensual sex before, are they allowed to say no?
We've done this already before. And even though this particular instance has happened, this ain't that. So once I say yes again, then I'm no longer a victim. So this so part right, right here disappears. Right. So that's the right. rain the right. the right. the right. right. in the sight for our young people. Okay. And so they they tend to no longer see where they can be a victim in any particular situation. Because now I am a part of this cycle of uh, the perpetration of harm to myself. But sometimes the yes becomes a yes because you absolutely don't know what else to do, and that's how you feel you can start to eat. What I want we did a consent summit at the juvenile court, mm -hmm. and it was um, it was so disheartening to me yes. that male understood consent a lot a lot better than the female yeah. for that reason. Yeah. Because for the female, it was so sometimes I want to play hard to get, sometimes I want him to keep going, and to get them to understand mm -hmm. that your no is your no, and you can own your no. That's just what it is. But then you had individuals that said, now I said no this time, then I said yes. So how can I say no now? Yeah. Because it was okay Tuesday, but Thursday, I just don't want to. Yeah. But in, a, in an adolescent mind, yeah. they do not feel empowered to go back to the no, because I just said yes two right. days ago, so how can I say no now? Yeah. But I don't Mental 
spiritual structure yeah. that was built in a child. Yeah. Yeah. Just like I'm going to grab you at 12 and teach you how to cook meatballs, baby. You're going to know how to cook this meatball for the rest of your life, right? Well, instead, I'm going to have sex with you. And I have to groom you. We always forget about that grooming. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which makes you make the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about what I would do immediately regarding sexual assault, is grooming. So what do we do? What? Right? So, so, so when we talk about grooming, we got to understand that the grooming yeah. process, hold on one second. We got to take, we got to, we got to call things out. So let's just talk about how grooming starts in church. Grooming starts when you teach young girls to be, to be, not just to be submissive, but that you should follow. Yes. So when you have a person of authority, whether it's your pastor or your daddy, I've been taught that this is the greatest thing
break down your mind to make different decisions. So when he, when she is, has now had an example of being what Dr. K said, so the talk subservient behavior because he, he couldn't control himself. What they gotta do with me? Exactly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. And so exactly. when you know, exactly. on the flip side with men, like mm -hmm. I know several mm -hmm. men, I know Justin and they know some of them play their games. Yeah. They have told me stories where they were eight, nine, and ten years old and babysitting. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. and I, when I speak, when I, mean, when I speak, I do not speak in gender. Right. Because I've seen my cousin, my male cousin was also molested. Mother That's the same thing. That. So same thing.
also let him understand that's still your decision. But when we talk about grooming, we are not talking just about to, to broaden the scope. Right. We are not talking about sexual interaction. Mm-hmm. I, when I say it, and I'm speaking about that, I can't agree. That's right. right. We are talking and about everything that makes you think and behave because of your behavior the way that you do. Right. So, but the black we're talking about. Hold on, hold on. But that's what we're talking about. Thank <laughs> you. 
dream of doing unless it has something to do with fast money yeah. and they have no identity. See, what used to happen is when my mother took us to Ghana, by your seventh, if I think your seventh day on earth, you had a name yeah. and an identity. Yeah. And Not the only talk about who you who were. Who you were. Who you were.
because I was 31 when I had her. So I knew at some point how to be an adult, how to raise her. The 19 year old, pretty much, I was young when I had so bright, she picked up everything I did. So the hot temper, she picked that up. The, the rough neck, I got to survive, as she said, she picked that up. So the second year old sees a more so mature to me. Yeah. So she, if you talk to her, you think you're talking to a 30 year old, right? Yeah. Because you made it beforehand. Exactly. These, this is what I tell with her. Like she said, we come out with no identity. No. When my daughter picked up the ball at one years old, you're going to be a basketball player. My youngest daughter, she loves gymnastics. You're going to the Olympics in 2028. We're going to play this. We're going to breathe this in you. Yeah. We're going to pour life into you. Yeah. That's the problem. Broken people break people. Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing. When these, these people are molested, when you're molested as a kid, you're broken. Your parents don't know how to fix you they're because fix you. they're broken. Right. They don't seek out the help that they need. They think in an African American community, oh, we're not going to go to a psychiatrist. We don't want any of those know what's going on.
because we don't even teach what it is. So my mother was like, you know, your vagina? Yeah. And I'm like, the whole, the conversation in the room was totally different. So when my sister had her kid, my mother immediate reaction was, bring this kid here, you come here, and we gonna raise you and the kid. Because now I need to install some boundaries for you too. My sister decided, she wanted to have her own bath because my mother was losing too cool. too late. It was too much because she used to doing what she did. So she had to go. And the state said, no problem. I'm going to take your kid and put him with somebody else that's an adult. And she turned around and said, the kid. At 16, we moved fast for her. So I know she was ready because these guys were older. The 16 year old's father. I still call him my brother-in-law today because he took up the mantle. He was older, they had a kid, he tried to marry her. She was like, I ain't trying to get married. But he adopted the back kid nice. and said, I'm gonna raise him like a man. So he took up somebody else's labor and raised it. And my nephew is 42 this year. Cause I'm like, we, we have a generational gap in conversation. And I look at, during that time, as they got grown, we got grown, the conversation changed because our ages changed. When my sister had her daughter, their age is so close, yeah. they can't talk because they don't know how, because I'm hardy, you are. I'm, ju I'm juicy, you juicy. Your mom juicy, because you, she was 12. How does she know raise you? How does she know to understand? I was twelve. You were twelve. What does she know? But she didn't have a conversation for it. Right. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Like my sister, like the men's other generation grows. Yeah. So now my nephew is forty-one, and I'm fifty-five this year. So he'll be forty-two. We on the same page. If any other rules, we can take because why? We are the same age. But there's no one, there's no one. There's no The guilt thing you saw when you ended up being on parents. The guilt, that's what I said. So with my sister, I realized there's some guilt. She, she had in terms of guilt. Because her daughter got, somebody came on to my niece. And my sister was like, oh my God. What did I do wrong? I said, what, what did you do wrong? Oh my God. That's good. I, I, I don't know, why would he hit on her? What conversations are you having with her? Well, I told her that her pocketbook the tower. The, the is a tower. Yeah. The same thing her mama told her. So we've been nursing at the at the breast of contaminated dysfunctional people. We been we have been
the, the adults still have the children, the children get a little less yes. and the mm -hmm. cycle is still going. Yes. So it's, I think the direct and where is, and again, like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Where do we, right. Well, where, it's not going to be back to where we came from. Where do we start? I guess that would be the question. Well, we start because we start, okay. let's start trying to fix the world until we fix our own. Yeah. Now, I think the well, well, so that's why I No matter. 
no matter what. So when, so when uh, green suit preacher person that they idolized from the one side. This is that one. Right. So when he told my friend that he was gonna make him one of her girls, oh, we can fight hands up, and I don't even fight. Right. But I stepped to that grown ass man, and somebody had to say, you know what? You gonna have some problems if you say the devil right there, because that she belongs to God. Right. You see what I'm saying? So when they started telling me these stories of abuse, and they were like telling me everything that was happening to them, and I was just like, they did happen to me. What do you mean? They did that to you? Wait, that happens in abuse? And so you even learn to survive through your own oh, abuse yes. by listening to somebody else's story of abuse. I'm not going to ever justify somebody not being there for their child or whatever, but we're taught to survive. So when I finally had to tell my mother that somebody harmed me, and she remained silent, and it hurt me to the core because she didn't respond, I didn't know how to deal with that. And your mother, your sister, mother was a, context. Your mother was a fighter. Absolutely. In every sense of the word, this community, she bullhorn, uh, walk to walk on a site where all white construction people, y'all gonna hide, she was that person, so she fought for everything. No, if a nigga put his hands on somebody, they came and told Mary and Seth. Mary and Seth. If talking about abusive family structures or whatever, if somebody, if a nigga was beating his woman, and Mary and Seth knew about it, that nigga's getting dealt with. The Stones were gonna do it, yeah. And, 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 in that moment, not that she didn't tell me in that moment, she told me when my mom passed four years later. And she said to me, and I was saying to her, I finally got to a place with my mom where I'm no longer angry with her. My mother probably my abuse with that. Yeah. Right? And I was so mad at her for a lot of years. Because I was like, wait a minute, you told me, and this is another thing that we do in room. My mother told me that I could never do anything that she did not know about. And that I, there would never be anything happening on her watch that she did not know about. You understand me? So I mocked myself in that regard. I was an excellent student. I participated in all kinds of programs. I was spokesperson for CPS and all this other kind of stuff because I always knew that my mother saw everything. But how come she didn't see this really touching me? Right. And so right. I was just like, wait a minute, but I don't have to say anything to my mom because she knew. She knew everything. Because she told me there ain't nothing I can do that she don't see and she don't know. So I, I sat back and I waited patiently. Like, okay, she gonna go, she gonna go get that. Because that other dude put his hands on my sister and he, he got that one. You know what I'm saying? So I, I waited patiently until that day died. And she cried. And she cried. And that sent me into a, a tailspin that I didn't quite understand. And so sometimes, not to make an excuse for anybody that's not addressing an abuse that has happened, particularly a parent or whatever. But my sister helped me to see something that helped me in my forgiveness. And for me to help in my healing was that at that particular moment, my mother had to come to the realization that she had been with me. Well, and that it's, particular it's so part. Much more that it's, that it's, to your life. And yes, I did that. And, and so that's not okay. No, I mean, the, the thing with that was you saw this person from 12 to 17. I was a runaway with this grown man, and you knew where I was. And the only one thing you can tell me trying to justify is she stopped him with the police one day, and he had my coat on because my mother was known for putting out issues and everything. Okay? So, how do you justify not knowing where I am and he has on my coat? Her exact words were the police told her that there was nothing that she could do because I would have to testify against him and she knew that I wasn't going to testify. I'm a minor. I don't have to do a damn thing. You're the mother. You take the collect calls that come to this house. I got a box in my trunk right now mm -hmm. of all the jail letters. Why is this grown man right here doing it? Why is your brother coming in the house with black eyes? Like you knew, you could walk past me on the street. That's a right away. What's your mom? I don't know anything about that lady because she plays the shit. Did nothing ever happen. She but she's been taught to. So that's the trouble. But she's been taught to. She's been taught to survive. This did not come out. No, no, no. What I'm saying. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that probably would have helped. I just not hearing about it. Stories like that.
was those people, like my dad's people, don't play no games. So if I wasn't scared and I would have told my uncle at that time, oh, the whole most I would have been turned out. And I would have been turned out.
we're trying to identify with the, with the master himself. So now we trying to become the master ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's like what it's just like what abuse people have been abused when you become penetrated. Right. So you become you become a perpetrator. Exactly. So so and not not to not 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 to bring up not to constantly bring up the R. Kelly issue, but we look at two sides, we look at the victimized and the victim. And the, the problem is we never after we put it in the forefront as the victimized and as the victim, we, we never give any therapy to it. So if we never treat the problem, the victimizer does what? He continues to, or right. she continues to exactly. victimize. Then the victim either either uh, becomes a shell or becomes a victimizer themselves. Right. So the process continues. So, okay, we have that. Let's, let, what's the process? Where's the root? What's the hill? What's, what's the hill? What's the hill? So, what's the hill? Well, I say you gotta stop what we call generational curses. I, I say that. And I'm gonna stop that. I say generational curses. I'm gonna speak to that. You gotta, because I'm the only person that has not shared my yeah. story in none of you. None of you know how I even got in this conversation. <laughs> the truth but, is, is that we're all. I don't know if I'm gonna go sit here and say, I'm sorry.
help that we need. So I would say that that is one solution, that we start establishing safe space. You gave a, another perfect solution, that your children's friends should be able to come to your safe space. Because the whole what happens in my house stays in my house is still going to perpetuate for generations to come because it's been taught for generations. So they have to be able to go somewhere. I had, at my book release, I had a lady that told me, she's like 65 at the release. Yeah. The first time she said that she was a victim. Mm -hmm. And she said she had never said anything because mm -hmm. they weren't going to believe her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's 65. Right. So we have to be able to have places that are well equipped, well booked, well able to help <laughs> everyone involved. But I also think, and, and I'm going to come to you, we need to take a step back because we need to learn how to talk. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to this situation personally because that's my family, so I know it for a fact. She ain't even. She oh, ain't wow. it, right? <laughs> She's not. <laughs>
from what our thought processes are of what the rules should be.
remember going to school and learning about physical abuse. I had no clue that my father was physically abusive to me and mentally abusive to me. Thank God for safe spaces. That's that's a, a point back on solutions. By the time, I, because of this, every year my school specifically has not been teaching this counter. But what I was being taught at home. I eventually learned that this is wrong. What's going on in my home is wrong. So by the time I was 17, I began to fight my father back. Now, I'm not speaking to you on your healing. My father tried to kill me when I was eight months pregnant at 23 years old. He tried to hit me with a car. I was beating and eight months pregnant. Forget that situation. I was homeless three times running away from my father. Once when I was 17, once when I was 19. Where is your mom? Protecting my father. You protecting my father. Hence, hence.
an option that we very rarely like to talk about, like the, what you call it, the under, 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 yeah, under, 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 under,
I'm never going to show Catherine and somebody else, and they ask, I haven't dated in eight years. Why? Because I was broken. Mm -hmm. I was broke the next person. So I came to that conclusion that I was broke. It wasn't until I went to God and said, you know what, I need to be fixed. And he told me, you have to forgive that person. Whether you want to or not, when I forgave him, I became holy again. Yeah. So we have to start with ourselves. Forgive ourselves for the abuse that, that we sustain, but we also have to look at the person who face value. That doesn't mean forgiving myself, I'm going to take you back in my life. That doesn't mean the things that you did to me, I'm going to immediately forgive you. I'm not. It's going to take time. And forgiveness doesn't happen overnight. I'm one of those people who can hold a grudge. So help me to understand how that works. Because again, I put myself in a straight like, there's no need to keep going back and forth with you. You who you are, I'll never get an apology. You're going to be whoever, whatever, whatever. But now I just feel like it's a different ball game because it's my children. She is that kind of, she does she if she doesn't have to talk to me again ever again in her life and she's okay with that. But, and I'm okay with that too, but I now I'm at a point where I'm fighting for my kids. Life. So you have to set those boundaries. You have you have to have boundaries. You know, people who complain about boundaries are people who want to get around. She wanna get around those boundaries with you because I know you're affected by it. I'm never gonna apologize. And I tell people all the time, sometimes we have to be okay with the apology that we're never gonna get. Mm -hmm. We're never gonna get that apology. She's trying to get around those boundaries by look, these are my boundaries. <coughs> this is what you can do, this is what you can do. You're not crossing this line. And it's not out of the hurt that you you uh, inflict it on me. Right. It's not it's not about that. It's about what you're gonna do, and I'm protecting my kids. I'm protecting them. I say all the time. My youngest daughter doesn't know her father. I'm going to protect her heart. I'm going to protect her heart. If he came today and said, I want to meet her, no, when I'm ready. When I'm ready, go go there. It's a different ball game for me because we met in her house for so long. So they are attached to her.
and you are a representation and reflection of what power looks like when you give ownership to who you are. And the only way your mom is going to be able to give ownership to who she is is if you stop. I mean, it's a mustard seed, but that's still enough. So when we talk about the Bible, we talk about faith and all that good stuff, a mustard seed is still enough. She's looking for the crack. And all she's looking for is that little mustard seed crack. It's not your children. Because at the end of the day, I know what you're thinking. You're like, I can't let her infest, you know, my children or affect my children and all that other stuff. You have raised them right, trust that. You have raised them accordingly. You have instilled something in them that she does not know. And there's, there's, there's something within her that hangs that. Because I couldn't give it to my baby. She got it all on her own. So I can't get ownership to it. So I mean, it did, did celebrate that and embrace the fact that you are and you rose above and you're not responsible for bringing her back. You just be, you should get there. But if you're not gonna give you 100%, if you're gonna give you 99.9%, she's gonna rely on that as an excuse. That's her crutch. Yeah. Get back on her and her just by being son. And I can say one more thing about your oldest son. He's gonna come back. He will come back. I went through that same thing with my mom. It's yes. always at the exact same age, like 19 and 20. I hated my mom, and I didn't want to tap. She couldn't, she, I deleted her on Facebook, I blocked her number, she couldn't get on her phone on Twitter, anything, any way she could kind of Why? Like, like, That's what I was going to ask. Why? Why? Uh, all right. Growing up, I found out my, my dad, my mom kept me from my dad, and then my dad was trying to get in my house. That is even more, that's a more so decision. So, as I got older, and then my mom kicked me out when I was 15. She moved, one, she moved me down to Champagne for huh? all my family. And then she kicked me out. Oh, All that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, like, and the worst part about that is I I applied to Whitney Young and Walter Payne and got it. And she oh, wouldn't, Whitney Young? She wouldn't let me come back right. So I had the whole resentment. Mm -hmm. And then I was hearing someone coming from my day. And the biggest thing with him is he saw your strength, but he hearing, he getting pulled in the other way, so he's confused. And that was my thing. My mom raised me so well up to the 15 years yeah. when we moved down there. And like I saw her with she man, she she man saw her all this stuff. And it was like, and it hurt. It, it hurt because yeah. you saw that power. She, he saw that, I saw that power in her. Yeah. That's probably what he's going through. He know your power. But somebody else is pulling away from him. And he gets to see those small little downfalls yeah. and you do have them. So they look a lot there because then it makes him question what he's been going through. But he'll he's come back. back. And he'll come back. It's like, so it's like, young ago, me and my oldest son kind of went through something similar, but it was when I was in the next environment. Y'all are dating. Like, which I know. Like, so and he's he, he told me. He said either I was going to go to jail for killing him or I had to pull all the way back mm -hmm. to save my own sanity because I couldn't take what he was doing mm -hmm. to you. So, but, but right now, if I call him, he's pulling up. I mean, with our relationship, is fantastic. They're trying to become men at the same time. Yeah. They can't be married right. at the same time. So we'll Don't be, worry about your family. So we have this conversation again. Are we going to talk about how our young boys are trying to be men mm -hmm. in these streets and how this cycle of abuse, even mm -hmm. physical and a lot of times sexual, Because that was something for me was a stickler that 
out on social media. Mm-hmm. And people who had been abused were feeling some type of oh, way. My calls went up, my inbox went like, up, yeah. everything who went up. Who didn't know that they were abused? I made a few people up, though. So, didn't know you could do it. You know what I mean?
I have a list of about 50 topics that I want to hit. This is one of them. But I want to, all of them we're going to have to break down in the text. It's like yeah. this one, we're going to have to break down. Another one, a big one I want to do is I want to hit a good discussion with all black men. I want to get a bunch of black men. Because we want to acknowledge what we meant there. Because like a similar thing that y'all said, I dealt with. The waking up with the girl riding you in college, like, because you went to sleep and you was too drunk and one trying to do that, and you wake up in the middle of it, and you're like, uh. And how, she, and how she can be the aggressor. And, and it's like, then, yeah. exactly. And it's like, mm-hmm. we don't get the space to talk about those things because it happened to me, but I know at least 25 of them, my homies who I went to college with in high school with who had the similar, similar things with that. Yeah. So, and it was right. It, 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 it yeah, is. Yeah, but then there's yeah. also like, that thing is like, how we, I, y'all were talking about when y'all woke up during, who the hell did you tell her in that situation? Right. Especially you. Let's see what's going on. Yeah. 